Um, before we get going, I want to thank a couple of people. Um, this would not be possible without a number of people. Um, primarily, I want to start with the Mohawk people of the Haudenosaunee Nation upon whose land we are. Um, Patrick is going to talk quite a bit about settler colonialism, and we should think through the implications of that, including for this institution. Uh, Dr. Terry Lindsay, where are you, Terry? And Jill, where's Jill? <laughs> Jill, you are a wizard. <laughs> thank you for all of the help, Terry. Thank you for supporting this. Um, I want to thank the IT and facilities people who have, like, there are labor. There are laborers who have set this up for you. There are a lot of people who make this college work. Um, think of them, right? Um, the Global Center for Rural Communities, which is sponsoring this talk, this is a new uh, um, organization here on campus where we're trying to do more things like this to really think through issues, especially issues that, have, that impact rural communities. Um, I also want to thank my students, some of who are forced to be here because there's an assignment tied to this. So uh, we're going to talk about power in this talk today. Power is the ability to alter the social structure, so here you are. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to say a couple things about how tonight's going to work. Uh, Dr. Blanchfield's going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes or so um, on this research and scholarship. Then we're going to sit down for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I have a couple of questions for him about this campus culture in particular and how it relates to his work. So we'll get into some of that. Um, and then we're going to have a good chunk of time at the end, probably about half an hour or so, for a community conversation, for you to ask questions and for us to kind of talk about this stuff in a scholarly way. Um, so to introduce Dr. Blanchfield, this is Patrick Blanchfield. He's an associate faculty member at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research, um, a visiting scholar at New York University, uh, completed a PhD in comparative literature at Emory University, while also completing coursework in psychoanalytic theory and its clinical practice at the Emory Psychoanalytic Institute. Um, his doctoral dissertation research looked across scholarly disciplines and cultures to understand whether or not parental mourning for deceased children is a human universal or instead a matter of cultural contingency. Or, as he put it to me the other day when I requested a copy of his dissertation to read, heads up, it's super depressing. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps we can have some discussion here about how American culture understands its dead children. Um, as a freelance journalist, his writing on gun violence, gun control, and gun culture has appeared in dozens of venues, including the New York Times, The Nation, policy, Foreign Policy, Dissent, and elsewhere. If you go to his personal website, you can read articles with uh, headlines such as, What Makes Hunting So Divisive? Um, the Market Can't Solve a Massacre. Children of color already face violent discipline in schools. Arming teachers will get them killed. Guns and the Price We Pay for Freedom. And finally, Thoughts and Prayers. Um, which, which some of my students have read some of these for this. So his book, Gun Power, which you're going to hear about tonight, will be released by Verso in 2020, so coming out soon. Um, one final thing to say about Patrick and his scholarship before we get going. We're going to spend a lot of time here talking and thinking about guns, gun politics, how all of this relates to this idea of this thing that we call America. Um, I don't know about you, I found this public discourse on this issue to be utterly exhausting and exasperating. Um, it never really seems to get us anywhere productive. The thing that I respect the most about Patrick and his scholarship is that he gets us way beyond stale and tired debates about things, about these things, and instead takes us into new and often actually much more difficult intellectual terrain. Um, these are my favorite thinkers, those who can look at issues like gun violence and gun control and move beyond simple notions of left versus right, Democrat versus Republican, red versus blue, rural versus urban, black versus white. This issue, like so many other issues, is far more complex than such simplistic framings um, that shape our discourse. I hope you see that tonight. So, Patrick Lenfield. Hi. Can you, you, oh, wow, well, that works. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, awesome, in the back then, yeah. okay. Um, Thank you, Joe, for that uh, generous introduction. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I, I'm just honored uh, to Paul Smith and the community at large for the invitation. Your hospitality has been remarkable, and it's just been a wonderful time. Um, before I start, I, I want to flag that what I'm presenting is, is drawn from my book, um, 
gunpowder. And that's a, a project that is an attempt, I'm gonna set a timer. I timed this earlier when I read it to Joe's cats and it was uh, about 45 minutes, so let's uh, hope it, yeah. I'll, I'll stick on that, all right. Um, oops. Uh, so so the, the book is, is an attempt to think through these very deadlock debates about guns and gun violence and gun control uh, and to just produce a kind of new vocabulary that could ho hopefully open up some room for s something more uh, well, better. Uh, and to that end, and this is sort of the second thing I want to ask you, uh, is that as, as I do this, I, I ask you to please resist the temptation to immediately start thinking in terms of this very binary vocabulary of pro-gun, anti-gun, pro-Second Amendment, anti-Second Amendment, gun rights versus gun control, Democrat versus Republican, what have you. I promise that if, if you bracket thinking in those terms for just a little bit, I think you'll see that they're profoundly inadequate for grappling with the full history and current function of guns in American society. Uh, in fact, you may even join me in concluding that these terms uh, imply false choices and superficial antagonisms, concealing what in fact has been a reality of underlying consensus and deliberately limited horizons of alternative possibility. Uh, in other words, you may see the totalizing dominance of a system of social reproduction and social control that I call gun power, uh, but I get ahead of myself and I promise I'll gloss all the vocabulary and try to keep this as low a jargon as possible. Um, okay, here, here's how I'm going to proceed. I will narrate two historical episodes, one fairly recent and at length, and the other less so. I will then propose we consider these two episodes as emblematic and probably inevitable products of certain processes, tendencies, and priorities that have been recurrent over the course of American history. I will explain these as representing a particularly American approach to social reproduction and social control, gun power. And I will quickly summarize what that means as a model and sort of unpack its key features, but paying specific attention to dynamics of race, space, and extraction. All right? Cool? Cool. Um, before, uh, there's one last note, actually, which is that I'm going to narrate two scenes of, of really extreme violence. Um, because it's necessary, I will briefly relate what happened, who did what to whom, and what the consequences were. I have chosen these events because they are well documented and in different ways paradigmatic. Their horror is singular, but also, and this is key, they're not unique. Uh, the events I've chosen occurred within 200 miles and years of each other in the north of California's Central Valley. Uh, but I promise you similar stories with the same dynamics of power, trauma, and forgetting are written everywhere across our landscape, our history, and yeah, just the physical space of America itself. Um, so here, I'll, I'll get to that one second, but I do want to share these images. These are three images of basically the same place, uh, which is Germantown. It's a community or neighborhood now of Philadelphia, Northern Philly. Um, these are three scenes from Germantown. The first is the Battle of Germantown, which occurred during the Revolutionary War. I'm not sure if this is going to render quite nicely, but there you go. This was actually a loss for the Americans. Um, but it impressed the French enough that the French decided to supply us with us to supply the fledgling Continental Army with a tremendous amount of French rifles and muskets, without which the Americans probably would not have won the war. Um, that's the Battle of Germantown. This is another scene from Germantown a century later. Uh, the reason Germantown is called Germantown is because of the number of German immigrants who live there, and it's been occupied by German immigrants since the 1680s, or at least it was. Uh, and it's significant if you're a colonial history buff or into like early firearms insofar as that that's the crucible of the beginning of the American firearms industry. It happens in Pennsylvania, right? It happens first in Germantown and then it moves out to Lancaster. Uh, and the reason we have the word rifle with the etymology, that's probably from the German, but in any event, the designers of the best rifles, like the Kentucky Long Rifles and all that, were German extraction, right? These are people who came over from a very fractious part of Europe and they brought their design in making very, very good long guns with them. Uh, this is, you know, 100 years later, and this is a German Schützenverein, which is a type of shooting club. It's a sort of a male-centered activity of marksmanship, and this is a, a crazy swept the nation and actually is involved in the founding of the NRA, and we can talk about that later if you want. But this is another scene. These are all these German men, 100 years after the revolution, with their rifles. And finally, here's a scene from Germantown today. Uh, Germantown is one of the highest concentrated spaces of gun violence in Philadelphia currently. And that's handgun violence, right? This is, this, is, this is an image taken by my friend Jason Francisco, who's a photographer, uh, of what's called a murder corridor. 
And if you go to these different places in northern Philadelphia, as Jason does, you will see memorials left to people who have been killed by gun violence. Right. And he sent this to me early in 2013. Uh, and it's an image of a memorial. I don't know if you can quite read it, but it's Sandy Hook, uh, dedicated to Sandy Hook Elementary School, and it says, all our angels beneath it. Right. And when he sent this to me, he had a comment, which was, I wonder what the, the memorials to the dead of North Philadelphia look like in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. I think we can probably imagine what the answer to that question is, right? So what I, as we go into this talk and as I lay this stuff out to you, I want to try and keep in mind this kind of layering of space over time and just the strangeness of living in a country where, you know, the crucible of the American rifle industry is now the site of essentially hyper-concentrated handgun violence. All right. So with that said, uh, maybe, maybe not, sorry. Huh? Should work. Sorry. No, that's not right. Shit, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not a, much of an academic anymore unless I'm kind of profane. I'm really sorry about that. We, we can work through it together, but please don't um, take too much offense. All right, here we go. Um, now maximize. I can close this, right? Yes. All right. On the morning of Tuesday, January 17th, 1989, a man in military fatigues brought an AK-47 and two pistols to the playground of the Cleveland Elementary School in Stockton, California. His name was Patrick Purdy. He was 26 years old, white, and had a history of interactions with the courts and law enforcement that stretched back to his very early childhood. Purdy's parents had divorced when he was two after his father, a Vietnam veteran, threatened to shoot and kill his mother. Raised by his mom, Purdy moved often as a child, but attended the Cleveland school from kindergarten to the third grade. His early home life was chaotic and abusive and ended when he struck his mother in the face at the age of 13. Spent, Purdy spent his remaining teen years variously homeless on the streets of San Francisco, in foster care, and with his father, amassing a list of arrests on charges ranges from prostitution to underage drinking to weapons possession and more. As an adult drifter and loner, as news reports would later describe him, Purdy traveled the Pacific Northwest, struggling with alcoholism, drug addiction, and mental disabilities, unable to hold down a steady job. Beyond the generic testimonials that he was a, quote, nice young man, Purdy apparently left no lasting impressions on anyone, save for machine shop coworkers and welding class acquaintances, who recounted his, quote, seething hatred of Vietnamese immigrants, whom he insisted had things easier and took opportunities away from people like him. In one of his last encounters with authorities, Purdy was arrested for firing a pistol in a national forest, and when searched, was found to be carrying a book of propaganda produced by the Aryan Nations, a major white power organization. As the extremism scholar Kathleen Ballou has observed, the late 80s and early 90s were a period of robust growth for white power militancy, with over 175,000 Americans buying such literature, and many more, like Purdy, presumably reading it. Of course, we can never truly know what transpired inside Patrick Purdy's head, since after doing what he did, he blew it apart with a pistol on which he had scrawled the word victory. And we can't decipher for sure why he did what he did at his old school, or why he left behind a motel room filled with green plastic army men when he did it. But there's no mystery about what he did and whom he did it to. Patrick Purdy opened fire with a rifle on a crowd of children, three quarters of whom were Southeast Asian. In four minutes, he fired more than 107.62 by 39 millimeter rifle rounds, wounding 30 children and one teacher. He killed five kids, Rathan Arwar, Ram Chun, So Kim An, Wen Lim, and Tay Tran. The three youngest children were six, the oldest was nine. One child was Vietnamese, the other four Cambodian. Nearly all of them were war refugees. We may tell ourselves that we can never know Patrick Purdy's intentions, but in the starkest terms imaginable, body count, his actions speak for themselves. So too do the subsequent actions of many Americans in response. Current wisdom holds that a major mass shooting will receive national news coverage for no more than a week. Of the 10 highest body count mass shootings since the 1999 massacre in Columbine, the majority have occupied space on the New York Times at the front page for six days or less. The shooting in Stockton appeared on the New York Times front page for one single day, below the fold, 
and was swiftly cried out by coverage from Florida, where a Miami police officer's killing of two unarmed black men had sparked four days of protest and civil unrest. In what other Stockton coverage did appear, mainly in West Coast media, there was little interrogation of Purdy's links to white power. The question of bigotry was dispensed with by journalists noting that Purdy was, quote, too young to have personally served in the Vietnam War, I'm not making, I'm not making this up, and that some level of antipathy towards Southeast Asians was common among Anglos of his age and class. Again, this is in the New York Times, but it was fine. He was you know, no more racist than anybody else. With the role of white supremacy thus rendered at once unknowably obscure and unremarkably banal, media and authorities instead focused on something else, something granular, the weapon that Purdy had used, and the frightening possibility that criminals could access such weapons to deploy against police. In the Stockton Massacre, Purdy had used a Norinco Type 56S, a Chinese, ma a Chinese manufactured semi-automatic version of the world famous AK-47. Newspapers at the time regularly called the gun itself Soviet, and its genesis and popularity as an Eastern Bloc infantry rifle combined with its formidable appearance to make for powerful political theater. Purdy may have been a white supremacist with psychotic delusions of military service, targeting refugees from the same region where his father had served in a brutal counterinsurgency war. But all the same, his act was used to support a different narrative, that an influx of outlandish weapons was being deployed by criminals against the forces of American domestic order. This narrative turn appears in the earliest coverage of Stockton. You know, under a headline, uh, Weapon Used by Deranged Man is Easy to Buy, the January 19th edition of the New York Times linked the gun Purdy used to kill actual Southeast Asian children to hypothetical threats to police responding to riots in Miami, which again were caused by a police killing two unarmed black men. Explain the Times, in Miami, where the police say they have come under sniper fire in two days of racial disturbances, where drug dealers are heavily armed, and where many private citizens have access to guns as a result of lenient laws, Sergeant David Riviero of the police says there are, quote, all kinds of weapons on the street. Cops come under sniper fire during racial disturbances on the street. Please keep these phrases, specifically the one about streets, in your minds and that image as we proceed. They articulate a nightmare scenario that is elemental to gun power. The, project, the prospect of the proper authorities unable to project ballistic control over stratified, racially volatile space could instead become objects of precision targeting themselves. So what were the consequences of stop? Well, just a month later, in February of 1989, the U.S. Senate held a hearing on restricting assault weapons. Its star witness was Los Angeles Police Chief Daryl F. Gates. When it came to assault weapons, it stood to reason that Gates knew what he was talking about, since no other person done more to arm America's police with them than him. Indeed, in the wake of Watts' quote, racial disturbances in 1965, and specifically prompted by reports of cops taking sniper fire, Gates had founded America's first SWAT team, which he initially wanted to call special weapons attack teams, but the PR people at the LAPD were like, no, 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 you have to change it. So he changed it to special weapons and tactics. In his memoir, he says that this, this left him crestfallen. He was apparently very disappointed that they couldn't be attack teams. Chief of police in a city where whites were a 40% minority, Gates was also an evangelist for something called sweeps, which is essentially mass detention of everyone in a given space. I want to start thinking about space right up front. Basically, a certain space would be claimed to be gang territory, and the police would just detain every man who was black or brown in that space and search them. All right. Um, Gates was also a hardened drug warrior, a man who believed, quote, people, who, and this is an amazing quote, people who blast some pot on a casual basis ought to be taken out and shot. And who insisted that unlike normal people, some blacks were biologically predisposed to resist chokeholds. Uh, yet while testifying before the Senate, Gates enjoyed remarkable bipartisan deference. With compelling drama, he wove the Stockton Massacre into a frightening portrait of an urban landscape overrun by, quote, street punks armed with high-tech killing machines. There's a domestic arms race in this country right now, he said. Do you want us to be like Colombia, where everybody has automatic weapons? Everybody gets shot down there. Now, never mind that actually America had itself flooded Colombia with small arms throughout the 1980s. To the senators and press present that day, Gates' message was clear and persuasive. The authorities' control over space was slipping. Dangerous guns were falling into the hands of criminals, 
Gun control needed to be imposed on them, and law enforcement needed even more guns to use against them to do it. Events unfolded accordingly. In March of 89, LA announced its own assault weapons ban, and California enacted a statewide ban later that year. That July, in Washington, President George W. Bush issued an executive order banning the import of Norinco AKs and some 42 other foreign-made guns. Federal legislation took longer, and I can't spend time on this here, but the TLDR sort of version of this is that Democrats yoked an assault weapons ban to crime legislation that first failed and then was re-articulated by Joe Biden. Bill Clinton signed that into law in 1994 as part of an omnibus crime bill, uh, the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. Now, we can get into a long conversation about the empirical impact of the assault weapons ban, which expired in 04. I do not, although we could, we, I'm happy to do that in the Q&A. What's more important for our purposes now is the broader edifice of carceral expansion and police militarization that the crime bill represented, and the pivotal role that the attached promise of, quote, gun control played in selling that to the American public. Please allow me just to pause for a second and, and call attention to this bracketing. I'm not arguing for or against gun control. All right, just set that aside. Instead, I'm asking you to consider how and when the phrase gun control became a political rallying cry and how it has come to stand in for an entire forest of interconnected social tensions and contradictions. Search a newspaper, book, or journal archive for occurrences of the phrase gun control, and you will find something striking. It basically doesn't occur in American English until the early 60s. The story of the term's genesis is also too long to get into here now, but suffice it to say that it was cemented in the public lexicon by the 1968 Federal Gun Control Act, which was a follow-up to President Johnson's own omnibus crime control and safe streets bill. A bill that vastly increased federal funding for hiring and arming police in riot control and counterinsurgency warfare. And I want to gloss what I mean by counterinsurgency warfare, right? This is the idea that in a counterinsurgent asymmetrical warfare scenario, you control the territory, right? You have troops to patrol it, but you don't control the people within it. They're resisting, they're insurgents. So you determine your strategy based around controlling the territory and controlling people within it. There are two points here. First, gun control is not a natural, obvious, or ancient term in American politics. The term gun control comes from the same turbulent crucible of militant leftist activism, widespread social unrest, urban rebellions, and blowback from humiliation in Vietnam that also saw American politicians getting, quote, tough on crime and waging war on drugs. Second, and this is really important, Note how the discourse of gun control is thoroughly interwoven with rhetoric of space and ideas of territorial control. From the very start, the discourse of gun control has been all about America's, quote, safe streets and protecting those streets from the influx specifically of foreign guns. Likewise, in policy terms, the single biggest through line in the history of modern gun control has arguably been the intensive, spatialized criminalization of entire neighborhoods. From the 70s onwards, numerous American cities, LA, DC, Kansas City in particular, became laboratories for refining and then exploring a suite of discriminatory policing practices and programs, all in the name of fighting criminals and stopping gun violence. Even a substantive proof of these worked was almost non-existent. Right, the fruits of this period include a rehabilitation of pretextual vehicular stops, carry stops, right, cops can just stop you for whatever reason when you're driving, and also the building blocks of what in New York would become known as stop and frisk. Right? Um, during the 80s, this was doubled down on in response to the crack epidemic and was also further boosted in the 90s with a turn to so-called community policing, which again, like, is one of those terms that sounds like something other than it actually is. The bulk of community policing money went to SWAT teams. So that's community policing. Uh, this tendency has continued throughout the 2000s and 2010s, unfolding in conjunction with unprecedented, unprecedented police militarization under Bush, Obama, and the Trump administrations. Today, gun charges are routinely used to maximize sentences for low-level drug possession, and federal prosecutors mine state and municipal dockets looking for old and pending small claims cases to which they can add compound federal charges. Now, I want to just be clear and think about the spatial dynamics. You can, you can catch a federal gun charge if you are caught in the proximity of a gun. In some municipalities, that will even make you be described as a quote-unquote violent criminal. You don't have to use the gun for anything, you just need constructive possession. 
right? You can be in a car with a gun. But also in a lot of these places, there are guns all over, right? People stash guns in, you know, under park benches, in garbage cans, etc. From the point of view of the feds, if you already have a low-level drug charge and they can catch you and find a gun near you, that can arguably be your gun and you can be looking at a five-year federal minimum. All right. Now, this has been a situation that has steadily increased. You can see this chart here, right, through a, pro a project known as the Safe Neighborhoods Program. Again, it's all about space, these neighborhoods. We have to keep them safe, right? Um, and again, this is a through line through the Obama administration and the Trump administration. In 2017, as part of his tough on, as Trump's own tough on crime platform, and one of his first actions in office, Attorney General Jeff Sessions directed the Justice Department to ramp up firearms prosecutions through revamping a Bush-era safe neighborhoods programs. Right? As of the first quarter of 2018, they have far and away surpassed any record set by any previous administration. I want to repeat, there is little reason to believe that any of these initiatives have done anything to get guns off the streets. The retrieval rate of guns from things like stop and frisk is like two and a half percent of all stops. The retrieval rate for police stops when you're just driving through like Ferguson, the cops stop you, it's like three percent of stops. The minimal guns are being removed from these spaces. But the initiatives have done two other things. First, they have fed millions of black, brown, and poor human beings into America's system of mass incarceration. And they have fed tens of billions of dollars into American law enforcement agencies and municipalities. I mean this very seriously. For decades, hunting for guns has meant a bonanza of federal grants and weapons transfers for American police departments. It has also underwritten a vast apparatus of asset forfeiture, property seizures, and court fees. This isn't my own language here. This is, this is what the Justice Department itself has done inquiries in this in places like Ferguson. And what I want us to understand is that what that effectively does is it turns urban spaces into zones of wealth extraction, right? You, you, maybe we saw this has experience like getting pulled over in a small town, like you're five miles above the limit and suddenly you're looking at a $300 fine, right? Think that, but apply it to entire zip codes, right? You can predatorily extract fees, you can confiscate cars, property, homes, billions of dollars over the course of decades that sustain municipalities, right? This is also at a very real toll in terms of human lives, right? As we all must recognize, American police shoot American civilians, disproportionately minorities, with a frequency that has no analog anywhere else in the developed world, at least 1,000 people a year. As of this year, homicide by police is the sixth leading cause of death for American men aged 25 to 29 of any racial background, with black men being two and a half times more likely to be killed by cops than white men and black women one and a half times more likely to be killed by cops than, uh, than white women. So I just want to say again, think of what's happening to urban places as a type of extraction, right? Wealth is being extracted, people are being liquidated. We're getting a glimpse of these sort of hidden hierarchies and geographies of human disposability and vulnerability to wealth extraction, right? Those, human hier those hierarchies and those geographies have considerable precedence. Now I'm going to move on to our second example. Right. On Sunday, April 5th, 1846, Captain John C. Fremont and his men arrived on the banks of the Sacramento River near what is today the city of Reading. This expedition was illegal in a variety of senses. America was not yet at war with the Mexican government, and Fremont had unilaterally invaded Mexican territory, defying direct orders to survey the Rockies. But such technicalities meant little to John C. Fremont. At 33 years old, Fremont was a properly Washingtonian figure, specifically the young George Washington. Like Washington before him, Fremont was a Virginian who had been formally educated in topography and employed as a surveyor. Like Washington, too, he held grand ambitions for political advancement and personal wealth, the latter to be gained through dubious frontier real estate claims. And like Washington also, who demonstrated this trait in ordering campaigns against the, against the Haudenosaunee, who called him the village burner, John C. Fremont was not shy about waging, waging brutal war against Native people. Fremont entered out to California on December of 1845, leading a group of soldiers, adventurers, and guides. 
These included Delaware and Lenape's and also the noted frontiersman Kit Carson. Although the purpose of his mission was nominally scientific, the Fremont's patrons in the Senate and the Department of Navy had made sure it was heavily armed and gave him a secret mandate to attack Mexican forces in the event of a declaration of war. Fremont, who was a remarkable figure in a qualified sense, uh, took this as effective license to personally invade California. Uh, after a brief show of force, he basically hoisted the flag outside Monterey and then ran away before the Mexicans could shoot him. Uh, Fremont worked his way north. He and his men passed first through large estates controlled by rancheros, semi-feudal Mexican landlords, and then into valleys only nominally under California Mexican control. This fertile region was populated by Yana, Shasta, and Wintu, and other indigenous people, but was increasingly dotted around the edges by American settlements. Somewhere near Sacramento, five such Americans, all employees of a private trading post, told Fremont that they'd observed, quote, about a thousand Indians in the vicinity, making preparations to attack the settlements. Fremont pledged, Fremont pledged to assist the traders, inviting them to join his party. All told, his group now made up 76 men, each carrying, quote, a Hawkins rifle, two pistols, and a butcher knife, and miscellaneous other weapons. On April 5th, 1846, Fremont and his men sighted the large group of Indians like they went to on the shores of the Sacramento River. There were indeed about a thousand of them, but they were not a war party. Instead, they were mostly women, children, and elderly people. An entire community got gathered to harvest salmon. Before I continue, nothing is to gain, to gain in attempting to like minimize the violence of the, the Mexican ranchero system, right? Nor still is anything to gain by downplaying the violence of Amer Native American ways of war, though in California they actually were pretty pacific, but that's another matter. What I want to stress, though, is that what Anglos brought to California was something different, a way of fighting defined by total war. Uh, colonial military theorists call this petit guerre, which is French for a little war, what we oftentimes call guerrilla war, using the Spanish. Uh, and contemporary military historians like John Grenier and Armstrong Starkey call America's, quote, first way of war. I'd love to talk more about it in the Q of A, but suffice it to say that the first way of war combines both continental European military science, right, and technology, with the individual marksmanship, small unit tactics, backwoods ambush techniques, and firing undercover skills that Europeans basically appropriated from Indians. It's, it's a hybrid mode of warfare. Unlike natives, who pre-contact fought largely limited conflicts to vindicate warrior masculinity or cover the dead after you lose people for uh, feuds or disease, Anglos fought to permanently claim land. This is a key thing, and think about space here. Indigenous people did not fight and hold position. The idea of like seizing an escarpment and just holding it out against all odds, like dying for some hill, it's a very European thing to do. Pick a hill and die, I guess. Um, in other words, the first way of war is all about conquering territory and imposing counterinsurgency control on the people inside it. Although I talk much more about this in the book, I cannot overstate to you now how fundamental firearms, and particularly flintlock like, and, and subsequent rifles, are to this mode of warfare. What happened that day in April shows why. Fremont and his men caught the winches with their backs to the river, within the 200 yards range of, the hawk, of their hawking rifles, but well beyond reach of the native boats. Without any efforts at parlaying, Fremont ordered his men to open fire. As soon as we got within rifle shot, they began to fall fast, remembered one participant. Our advance guard of 36 first came in sight of them and immediately charged and poured a volley into them, killing 24, wrote another. When the muzzle-loading Hopkins began to foul from being fired over and over, Fremont's men didn't stop. That's what the pistols were for. They moved in, picking the bush for close quarters. There commenced a scene of slaughter, which is unequaled in the West wrote one expedition member. This is rough stuff, but I'm going to read it. The bucks, squaws, and papooses were shot down like sheep, and those men never stopped as long as they could find one alive. Some Wintus tried to flee along the river. Carson led a detachment on horseback, cutting them down with tomahawks. Others tried to swim to safety, and they were also killed. No one knows how many Wintu died that day. Kit Carson called it a perfect slaughter. Uh, the historian Benjamin Madley, whose work I'm drawing on here, estimates 1,000 people dead, which would make it one of the largest uh, massacres of Native people in American history. I don't know any of their names. What were the consequences of this massacre, sometimes called the Sacramento River Massacre? Well, Fremont and his men ate all the salmon, uh, and then they continued their expedition north. They shot every Native they encountered on site and committed other large-scale massacres in response to putative retaliatory threats from Indians. 
Eventually, Fremont gets involved in the Mexican-American War. He becomes one of the state of California's first senators, then its governor. He actually is brief, I'm sorry, rather, uh, he's the first Republican candidate for president of the Uni United States. He runs under a platform called uh, Free Wealth, or the Free Land, Free Men, Fremont. You know, this has a ring to it, I guess. Uh, and then he also he becomes super wealthy, surprisingly, uh, with all the land he's captured, which they later find gold on. So he invests it all in railroads. The railroad stock collapse, and then he dies in a actually he dies in a pension or home on Long Island. So you know, <laughs> I won't say any more about that. Uh, as for the went to another California natives, the violence Fremont brought was only the beginning, and I. Uh, the state is, it's, it's hard to find consensus figures, but there were about 300,000 Native Americans in California before contact in 1769. By the time gold was discovered in 1849, Spanish depredation and disease had brought it down about half that. Within the next decade alone, it was like literally from 1849 to 1859, the indigenous population of California would drop by 80% to around 30,000 persons. That stunning drop coincides with the variable orgy of genocide, slavery, and rape perpetrated by American newcomers. In 1851, California's first governor, Peter Burnett, described settlement in terms of, quote, a war of extermination until the Indian race becomes extinct. Now, I could get more granular about this, but what I want us to sort of think about here is, and you can read it in the book if you'd like, essentially, on an industrial scale, California makes possible the massive seizure of land and confinement of indigenous people. The militia is formally chartered under law in 1851 and receives literal millions of dollars in handouts of weapons from the federal government and from the state of California. There are laws that basically allow indigenous people of any age or gender to be seized by um, settlers and used for chattel labor. Uh, those people were then put to work to dig mines, to work in orchards, uh, and build railroads. And again, I, I just want to like stipulate this: like the War Department starts selling guns to settlers at cost, and between 1848 to 18, but that's still not enough. We're talking about a tremendous amount of guns, and between like 1848 and 52. Settlers buy something on the order of six million dollars of small arms. That's in 1800s money, right? So you have settlers crossing the Great Plains. They bring cannon with them. They drill. So with all these guns in play, the inevitable happens. Indigenous people start shooting back, right? Uh, and so in 1854, the California legislature passed a law banning the sale of any firearms to indigenous people, right? It criminalizes native gun possession. Beyond impeding resistance and giving settlers an advantage, the law also ratifies a fundamental pretext of the entire settler enterprise, that indigenous people were an existential threat against whom genocide was actually a kind of, quote, self-defense. Precisely because natives could resist, their use with guns, and their simply having them was preemptively criminalized. Because they existed, California natives had to be exterminated. Because they, re because they resisted, their extermination was righteous. Meanwhile, and this is key, the law deprives indigenous people the right to have guns to hunt. Right? They're moved to reservations, unfamiliar ecologies, where they don't have weapons to either hunt with for food themselves or to produce animal-based goods for trade. Right? This effectively generates mass starvation and vulnerability to disease. Uh, and by 1900, there are just 15,000 native Californians left. A century earlier, that would have just been Northern California's population went to alone, law, right? And that law from 1854, criminalized native, native gun possession, stayed on the books until 1913. All right. These episodes offer vignettes of this system that I call gun power, right? I'm more granular about this in the book, but here I'll just say that gun power operates by widely distributing weapons and the prerogative to use them differentially across social hierarchies. In the broadest terms, this distribution ultimately serves the purpose of perpetuating inequality and containing disorder within specific groups, communities, and spaces. Right? Crucially, it's also all about territorial control and preserving certain processes of wealth extraction. Right? The spatial logic is really key. Gun power basically dictates that there are certain places where gun violence is just normal. 
not only just normal, it's good, right? It's accepted, right? Whether it be on the historical frontier, in post-industrial urban ghettos, or in the far-flung theaters of Americans' counterinsurgency wars, there must always be some place where guns, quote, belong. Some out there, over there, or to borrow Gerald Bates' phrase, some down there where everybody gets shot. By contrast, there are certain other places where gun violence is seen as completely unacceptable. And if it pops up in those places, this is an all-hands-on-deck emergency, right? Think here about how a shooting in a suburban school, right? The mass shapes, your chances of actually being one are tiny, but when that happens, that produces massive social mobilization. Whereas the regular drumbeat of gun homicides in places like North Philadelphia is just understood, well, that's what happens there, right? I'm trying to say that, to suggest that this is both a normative, a descriptive, but also a normative approach, right? In order to maintain the boundaries between those spaces, I argued that gun power basically delegates to individuals tremendous decentralized ability to carry guns, right? We widely have a franchise. We're remarkably liberal about our gun rights in this country, right? What that effectively does is it allows individuals to participate in these very delegated, decentralized regimes of gun, gun point compulsion, right? This is, again, this idea of legitimacy. There always has to be somebody who should have a gun, right? There's always a good guy with a gun, whether it's a Pinkerton to a police officer to a concealed carrier like Good Samaritan. The idea is there's always somebody who's carrying a gun that's righteous, right? And they're there to defend spaces. Okay. Now, I'm going to abbreviate some of this because I want to point to the space and legitimacy dynamics of this, right? Our conversation about, about gun rights and gun control is really all about the Second Amendment, right? Functionally speaking, though, I would argue that the ability to carry guns and the ability to use them has always been less about the formal letter of the law than actually maintaining certain processes of extraction. Right? It's about arming slave patrols. It's about arming hunters. Um, and that these are produce particularly intensive types of hyper-concentrated extraction in particular spaces. Right? <coughs> if you consider sort of the situation that prevailed on the American continent prior to the arrival of Europeans, you have indigenous peoples practicing a variety of social arrangements in a multitude of landscapes pursuing a wide array of different types of agricultural and other types of like wildlife maintenance, right? They're hunting specific game species, they have trail systems, they have intricate systems of trade that extends as far south as the Yucatan or up to Hudson Bay, etc. right? When the Europeans arrive, they view this as wasteful, this is inefficient, right? There's this whole tradition in the English language of calling America a wasteland, right? It's not just waste in the sense of being like blasted and terrible, it's waste in the sense that it's uncapitalized. So what this essentially does, what the, the colonial response is, is to flood those spaces with guns, widely empower people to carry guns, and this is both white people and their proxies, um, and to extract wealth from it. Right? And these images here, I think, sort of get this very basically. Right? And the one we have, I think, is um, a Kiowa buffalo hunt. Right? And on the right, we have an example of what the Lakota call the genocide of the Buffalo Nation. Right? As opposed to sustainable crop rotation, Right? We have the Europeans practicing monoculture, tobacco, cotton. These are inherently unsustainable, too. You're screwing with the nitrogen balance, you're destroying the topsoil level. It's always expanding. And the way the system deals with this is just more and more guns. But again, California's a great example of this. Guns circulate. There will always be bad guys with guns. This is built in. It's not a bug. This is a feature because that then justifies more expansion and yet more guns. The system is constantly doubling down. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about sort of these dynamics of sort of racialization here. And this is something that I, it's delicate and hard to talk about, but I want to just do this. I'm going to add to this rather than read it to you because I think it's better for this space. I would argue, and I think I'm, I'm not hardly alone in this, that, sorry, I printed out some extra pages here which I really don't need. Um, look. It's not, I'll be blunt about this. This system exists at the center of like the charm circle of this, right? The person whose rights are most sacrosanct is the white man, right? Straightforward. 
However, if you look historically, whiteness is not given, it's contested, it emerges over time. It's oftentimes very literally negotiated over gunpoint. There's extensive literature in the colonial era of who are the people that we're going to arm, right? Who are the indigenous nations that we can arm to say, fight the French, right? Who are the friendly tribes who can be armed to do ethnic cleansing against people who are, say, allied with the Dutch? Again, we had this idea of, of like earlier colonial gun control, which is all about like you know attempting to keep guns away from indigenous people. The reality is like the Dutch, the Spanish, the French, the Swedes, the Russians, the Germans, all of these people sold guns to indigenous people. Again, wide circulation. The system is dependent upon always exceeding its own claims of control, right? I would argue that our sort of racial logic here emerges from processes of extraction and from these like logics of human disposability. I want to give an example because I think it's, it's an underappreciated one, but it gets very granular. So many of you may be familiar with William Hornaday. Do we know Hornaday? Does anyone know Hornaday? Yeah, right. Um, you know, he's a zoologist, he's a taxidermist, he's the, one of the fathers of the modern conservation, wildlife conservation movement. Right? He's responsible for basically documenting buffalo annihilation, right? and then produces this entire movement. He goes on to found the National Zoo in DC, and then becomes the director of the Bronx Zoo in New York, uh, where he's actually uh, somewhat notorious, and quite rightly so, for putting uh, a Congolese pygmy named Ame Otabenga in a, quote, ethnological exhibit, where he wrestled with a monkey for entertainment of crowds and later committed suicide. Um, so that's, that's William Hornaday. But what people don't seem to know as much about Hornaday is that he also had certain uh, not entirely unique attitudes vis-a-vis -vis Eastern and Southern, Southern European immigrants. I'm going to read you some of his thoughts on this. It seems absolutely certain that all the members of the lower classes of Southern Euro Europe are dangerous menace to our wildlife. Wherever there are large settlements of Italians and Hungarians, they swarm through the country every Sunday and shoot at everything they see. Let every state and province in America look out sharply for the bird-killing foreigner. One of the particularly despised Italians, whom he called human mongoose. Uh, the Italians are spreading, 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 he wrote. If you are without them today, tomorrow, they will be all around you. Uh, his solution to this problem was straightforward. Uh, he basically believed that the Second Amendment didn't apply to uh, Southern European immigrants. He proposed a series of plans by which like, you could basically prove that you were an okay hunter, and then you could have the right to bear arms. It would only take 10 years after you were nationalized, etc. Right. I think we can describe this as the, we're witnessing, I mean, I know battalions who are perfectly fine, hunters like that, they're not human monkeys. What, sorry. Um, this is the process, you could just say, basically, by which Italians become white. Right. Um, how the process of becoming white is sort of intimately bound up in the product of their arms and the abilities to control space and extract resources from it. Right. Today, I would argue, and this is also the case, I would argue too, that like the Irish become white by serving in the police, right? By ex ex demonstrating their willingness to inflict gun violence on people of color in urban spaces, right? I would argue that, again, this situation is present today, and I would argue too that like, there is a very real way in which George Zimmerman becomes white because he killed Trayvon Martin. Right, he gets to participate in whiteness insofar as he preserves a basic scheme of human disposability. He's protecting subdivisions, right, against this outside force who's supposedly threatened. Right, that's kind of a boggling. That's his painting, by the way, that he sold on eBay. Um, this example up there on the left is something worth talking about. Basically, some Italians murder uh, Ital Italian members of the Black Hand, the supposed anarchist group murder a game warden in Pennsylvania. It's a long story, but it's kind of interesting. We could, I could talk about it in the Q and A if you'd like. <laughs> What I, what I want to get here, though, is how under gun power, the protection of whiteness can be deployed as a license to kill. And to that extent, the position of whiteness is often the credential of the people who are left standing on ground that they can claim was theirs. Right? And yet, and this is a key thing here, and this is the point that I kind of want to close on, because I'd rather take questions and talk and sort of like tie this up which is that under gun power, even the white man's own position is exquisitely fragile. In any given year, Americans account for fully one-third of the entire planet's gun suicides. It's over 20,000 people. The overwhelming number of these are white men, 91%, right? 87% men. And this is, again, implicated 
uh, biologic of space. I can talk about the data if we want, but basically, like Missouri offers a great example of this. Uh, as Jonathan Metzl, who's a sociologist and epidemiologist, has, has or the psychologist has documented, there are situations where uh, post Ferguson, you have a tremendous spike in gun purchases by white men living in outlying suburban neighborhoods, right? And they cite their fears of the riots and the riots, what they call them in Ferguson, coming to their doorstep, right? Statistically, what that actually produces is a large uptick in white men killing themselves and killing their family members, right? This is a remarkable thing, right? To the extent to which like, whiteness carries this prerogative to liquidate other people, it also exposes you to a hyper-attenuated vulnerability to self-termination by gunshot, right? And a totalizing system of social reproduction and social control Gun power distributes premature death across the racial, gender, and class hierarchies of American life. I would also argue, too, it's not a coincidence that the people who are like the frontline foot soldiers in the system, police, the military, veterans, are also at remarkably disproportionate risk of gunshot suicide, domestic gun murder, right, and femicide specifically. Even these people are disposable. I want to close by asking us to do one last sort of thought exercise. Um, look, we have no idea. Every time one of these mass shootings happens, people, I get a million calls from people are trying, like, why did this one happen? And frankly, we have no idea what happens in any of these people's heads. Right? There's no way we can know. And yet also, I mean, arriving in a place, a new place, right? You arrive in a place and it's full of, of life, right? It's full of people, it's full of people living in some sort of relationship to the land, to other creatures, right? Imagine showing up in that sort of space and just concluding that you have the right, the prerogative, the duty, I don't even know, but you have the right to just reach out and with a few, pa few pounds of pressure on your finger, liquidate anyone you see. And imagine, Imagine believing that so much that you're willing to die for it or even kill yourself, right? This is a kind of trap, right? And I think we need to be able to name that system and think about it as a sort of a totalizing system of human disposability. Clearly, some people are more disposable than others, right? But I just want us to think of ourselves into that spot in order to think through, like, what are the material and social conventions that make that possible materially, but also make it imaginable. And I think once we can do that, once we can all think about our collective disposability in those terms, we may be possibly able to undo that system, which is something perhaps we could talk about in the Q&A. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a training facility, right? You, you learn how to clear doors, right? You learn how to go through it. This is, this is at a private space out in Nevada where you can spend like $2,000 for a week of getting down doors. Um, you're going through, you're, you're going through breach and entry and you're learning all about the fatal funnel. Uh, there are a couple other photos where I've got like all, all these people who are doing it and like they're, you know, they run the gamut from like hardcore operators to retirees who are kind of coming just a little frightened to be around some of their gun handling stuff. Uh, but yeah, we learn how to go through doors. Is the picture distracting yeah. on our heads? No. Is it okay for you? Yeah. Right in your face. Yeah, we might want to turn it off. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jill. So I have two quick questions that relate to this campus community, and then sure. um, I uh, I want to open it up yeah. to questions, and, I'll, and we'll say some, some things about that. So um, I, I have I have the honor, the immense honor and privilege. My dad is a Vietnam veteran, and I and, and doesn't actually know how, why he was in Vietnam, which is interesting. Uh, this is a campus community with a significant veteran community, and um, so I've been thinking with some of them about the split in military culture that's experienced by two different groups on this campus. Um, there's this culture of veterans who have served often in theaters of war, um, and those who haven't, but still engage in a kind of cosplay, military costume play, I call it. 
Um, there seems to be a disconnect between these groups that has to do, in, in my mind anyway, with an awareness or not of American imperialism and, and what the military is actually does. Um, and maybe, maybe we can talk about that, but which is a roundabout way of asking, how do you make sense of the increased militarization of American culture these days? Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, like, the thing, the thing I want to flag at the outset is that it's, it's very striking how once you read all this colonial stuff, right, and you learn about the first wave of war, that that's what we're seeing reduplicated in this moment, right? You play like the new Call of Duty, right? You're the operator, right? You're the sniper. You're dropped into these spaces. You hide in the environment. Like, you sneak around through urban spaces. You're somehow, like, better than the native themselves, right? And this is almost an atavistic revision, return to that initial moment, right? This is a particular type of military mode that is deeply, quintessentially American, right? This is the first way of war. Um, and it's one of these things where it's like, all my friends who are veterans are like, I mean, I have a lot of friends who are veterans who come back and are terrified to interact with police, right? Who are familiar with the training of police, right? Or who have had the experience of having to be on the receiving end or inflict potentially lethal violence, and for whom the idea of being celebrated is in its own way a failed relationship, right? Like, that's not a way to connect with them. And again, there's something, this idea of disposability is a thing, like, and I, I keep on coming back to how as we militarize, we also outsource that militarization, right? We're more militarized than ever, but that militarization is not a mass mobilization in like the World War II mode. I'm not necessarily saying it's better, but like that this is now done by private contractors, right? And you get to participate in it by playing certain video games, by buying certain products. Right? We may talk about the Blue Lives Matter thing in that context, but yeah. yeah it's a military, yeah, so. Yeah, so, and I guess maybe going along with this, here's my second question, right? So um, I, one of the things I've noticed as a social scientist is that you see these black and white flags with different color stripes on the back of the vehicles. And, and that was not a thing until blue lives, or black lives matter happens. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing that, that's, that those are popping up as a response to black lives matter. I saw one the other day with a yellow stripe on it and I had to look that up and it's dispatchers. And I was like, did it, was anybody arguing that dispatchers lives meant they didn't matter? It's this interesting answer to a conversation that, that no one seems to be asking about. There's that part of it, but um, how do you understand that uh, related to, to this work? What's that about? What, like, so I situate this like in the book, and, and, and again, here I'll probably read it. Um, I situate this in terms like this is a very post-war on terror thing, right? And it's also a very like neoliberal thing too. We can talk about neoliberalism. Um, it makes military service a brand that you can buy. You support it through buying things. Right, you don't support it through politics, right? You don't support it by being like, well, maybe we, should, we shouldn't be sending human beings into like some mil meat grinder elsewhere, right? But maybe we should have more thoughtful military interventions. No, you, you, you put a flag on your truck, right? And it's, it's, I also have a lot of friends who are vets who, who you know, point out that like, this is a way to def arguably a way to deface the flag, and they react to it more strongly than they do like flag burning, right? But like, there's another element here too, which is this, it's, it's very tempting to think about this in terms of American military exceptionalism and American cultural exceptionalism, and that's very important. However, there are other, other major movements in other countries, and I think here specifically in Brazil, which sort of has its own version of this, where essentially in countries that have high degrees of economic inequality, um, that are currently places where you, there are political movements that are coming up that you could already be described as fascist, or at least are very invested in certain types of racial violence, where there is a, um, a grassroots turn of politics that's all about identifying with the police. You don't necessarily become a police officer yourself, you just signal your support for them, right? Um, Paul Amar was a, a theorist and, and um, scholar has documented this happening in some other places too, in like Egypt as well. And it's, it's quintessentially reactionary, right? You're reacting to circumstances by identifying with the forces of order. And again, it, the thing that I keep coming back to is like, I actually was on, I did an interview the other day um, on NPR, and the first, the, the, the segment that led into it was a, a member of the Fraternal Order of Police talking about an epidemic of police suicides, right? And, we, and the answer was, the, the, he said, the problem is how police are held to such high standards by the public, and uh, the public needs to be more forgiving of bad shoots. And that's why police are killing themselves. And be that as it may, like, well, if we actually, I mean, it seems more 
The Occam's razor answer is, well, if you ask people to work with violence for a living, that causes certain kinds of damage. That exposes you to certain types of risk, right? And is the answer at that point to identify with them more, like wear more gear that supports them? Or is it maybe to be like, maybe we shouldn't be putting people in these circumstances to begin with? Again, there are ways in which a lot of this like affirmation and identity, that, like this identitarian, like we'll identify with the profession, it's about treating the individual human lives as actually disposable. And that's, yeah, I'll, I'll more on that and say that's bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have so many more questions than that, I think. We have, yeah, so um, there's about, we have actually about 25 minutes. And what I would like to do is open it up to questions. There's a microphone there. I have one rule for this which is that be, be clear, be short, be precise, and actually end it with a question mark um, so, that, so that we don't end up with just on and on. So um, I, and I think there's a lot to talk about. So please come up to the microphone. Do I have to come up to the microphone if I can speak from back here? Yes, please use the microphone. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> there may be people who are hard here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> is it on? Okay. Um, so, I, I kind of want to paraphrase a little bit. It, went, it was really, really interesting. It's pretty deep and there's a lot of maybe com complex um, terminology that might not be familiar with some of the, you know, that might not have been familiar even to me, for example, in the audience. Um, but I, what I want to go back to is ask about the whole idea of, of becoming white. Yeah. That was a really neat, um, that was a really neat thread. But what, what I noticed was that over time you be different groups become white and then they become the perpetrators right so and that and that's uh, so i guess what i'm interested in short is if that's and it does appear to be what happens in human nature where's the you see and you talked a lot about structure and hierarchy and as opposed to human nature <laughs> and and sort of survival instinct and the kinds of things that happen in groups of people when they become one of the in, you know, sort of relates to bullying and a lot of other things. And so it, it struck me that you were suggesting that a lot of this is really about sort of really just the structures that are in place and are getting per perpetuated, but it strikes me that um, this is a lot about human nature. And I'd love to hear your take on, on how the the one who's been persecuted becomes the persecutor and it keeps, it, it appears to very often continue to happen. I'm interested in that. That's an excellent question. I, I think a lot of like, that line from like a lot of like the, it was popular in the 90s, I don't think people say it that much anymore now, but like hurt people hurt people, right? People, there's, it, sh it shouldn't be surprising that the overwhelming majority, like we're talking like 95% of people in prison have suffered child abuse of some kind, right? Or, or that there's domestic violence in these homes. Um, and there is a way in which clearly exposure to trauma produces traumatic, like makes you more likely to be a perpetrator, right? And clearly one of the things that we have, what this good guy, bad guy logic is so toxic about is that it prevents us from thinking through people who occupy both those positions at once, right? The idea that you can both be a victim and a victimizer at the same time, right? And instead we have this kind of weird like um, means testing of empathy that we do in terms of our politics where it's like, well, this person is more, you know, like, we have, we, there's a way in which a lot of like, um, liberal discourse is also about ratifying that and looking for like perfect victims and all that, and that's that's an unending problem. Uh, I, for me, it's I, I, I'm always hesitant to talk in terms of human nature, and I always historicize these things, right? And I think for me, like the if you look, the key thing that I, I want to stress here, and I'm borrowing on the work of a historian named Gerald Horn for this, is that if you look at just the correspondence of uh, colonial officials in colonial America, right, British colonial officials, you see them increasingly use the phrase white as they demand European immigrants precisely because they're worried about the slave rebellions, right? So we need more white people. You have like literal letters going back like this, like, oh, well, are the French people white? Well, they're Catholic, and that's a bit of a problem, but maybe we're willing to look the other way, right? And so for me, the thing is always, it's always about historicizing it. Right, and I, I, I grant that this could be problem of human nature here, right? But I always want to intervene in the specific systems of oppression that are producing this particular type of racial formations in the here and now, right? And but but also by the same token, I do think a lot about like 
James Baldwin's lines about like identifying as white and how that does a certain type of violence, right, to people who are white, right? <laughs> like there's a way in which like that involves the erasure of ethnic history. It involves also looking at perpetration as actually being a good thing, right? I mean, I have family who I won't get too personal about this, but came over in the 1900s and they were involved in the police and right breaking. And I don't. I, I, I want to resist the ability to be like, well, that was good, right? I mean, maybe they did what they had to do, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. I hope that's the answer. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not one or the other. It's incredibly, and it's incredibly complex and yeah. it's very, very interesting. Other questions? Um, so we often talk about, uh, we talk about it back at dinner, that we often fantasize the aftermath of these horrific events. And something that we came to terms with while we were speaking was how the bulletproof book bag is invented. We often think about how we can prevent these things, or how, sorry, sorry how we prevent these things. Um, how would we, if there is a way, potentially, how would we re remove ourselves from that mindset to think to the events leading up? Do you think there's a way we can do that? or? Are we too fantasized in this emotional state of aftermath? So, so like, are, are we unable to actually think an alternative? Exactly. So in the meantime, we're just going to traumatize an entire generation of children? Exactly. Children. Like, this and is what you're growing up in. That they individually are responsible for their own survival by making them purchase bulletproof backpack? Correct. How do we get out of that? Yeah, how do we remove ourselves, if even okay. possible? That's yeah. the thing that's happening in this country right now, by the way. Yeah. Like, my own children. Yeah. That's also, like, a key question. Like. My thought is, what I like doing, and I have to always be like very, I try to historic, I have to be very grand about these things. I like thinking about space. Where I don't like the, the terms of the gun control debate. I think the term gun control is probably worthless at this point, right? Um, I like thinking about places where gun violence is happening in terms of space. If you break it down by spaces, then you can come up with answers for like drawing back from that moment where it's just a fatal encounter, where it's someone going through one of those doors, right? And think about it, like, get the answers. It, if the system is always about doubling down on guns, you can see the traps right away, right? Intimate partner violence, right? Most mass shootings happen inside homes, right? There are men killing women and kids, right? The answer to that problem, if you, re if you listen to people, suppose we only have two options. Call the cops, namely have a guy show up with a gun, or a woman should get a gun herself. Right, and we make these, these, are, these are answers that are, are offered, and they're offered in defiance of all the data on how actual women's self-defense cases turn out, if they ever do go to trial, on the fact that police, you know, and their relationship to domestic violence is a little problematic, et cetera, right? But if we think about, like, well, what is the home as a space, right, we can think about the sequence of events that lead up to violence in that space, right? We can think about questions like, well, why do, um, what are the triggers of violence, but also like why do people not, what, what are the pressures that are put on a woman, right, and I'm speaking here of cisgender women who are parenting or whatever, that required them to be, and that's where they feel compelled to have to choose between, oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, uh, Disruption in space. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, like but basically you, you give people other options, right, this is like, this is the thing that's like, I don't, I don't have a lot of answers on some of these things, right? But I, I do think that it's very clear that these choices are forced, right? If, if, you're only two, if your only options are either get a gun yourself or have someone show up with a gun for you, that's collapsed a whole sequence of events that have led up to that, right? Why, I mean, for example, like the amount of women who stay with abusive partners because they earn less money and they can't afford childcare, right? Or they can't put their kids in another place. Right, or our, I mean, in a pretty perverse way, our response to like an partner violence is basically requiring women to have a period of homelessness so they can then get supportive care, which basically means that if you're a woman who's been repeatedly brutalized, you're constantly cycling in and out of homelessness in order to get care, right? So, I, you can do similar things about space for other types of gun violence, right? If you look at like the hyper concentration of gun violence places like, like, you know, Philadelphia, the answer is don't gentrify those communities. Put money in them. Give people jobs, right? Like, they, like maybe, maybe, maybe having a, a downtown park be an open air drug market. Like, maybe people had other opportunities to spend and make money and feel safe. That wouldn't be a problem, right? And so there's a way in which, like, what's 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 hard about this though is that none of these answers are sexy, right? And none of these fix gun violence immediately, right? Every time one of these things happens, every time someone gets, every time there's a mass shooting, we always want to do something that makes us feel better right then and there. And the answer over the course of decades and arguably centuries is what that means is we just arm more people in those places. And clearly that's not working. So yeah, I hope that's an answer. Um, so I've been like, thinking of, over the course of 
this um, talk. Why? I have like four questions, but I'll just give them to you and you can do with them what you will. <laughs> um, I've been thinking of why are most mass shootings done by, I wrote it all down, sorry. Um, why are most mass shootings that receive generous amounts of media coverage typically committed by national, nationalist, militarized white males in the middle class with seeming mental illnesses? Um, why do no females tend to commit mass shootings? Um, what does heteronormativity and um, kind of a gender binary have to do with gun violence? And um, what is such an emph emphasis on uh, mental illness in the committer of the crime say about us as a society and kind of how we view people with mental illness? So working backwards to those questions, like, so like, statistically speaking, the mentally ill are much more likely to be the victims of violence than to be as perpetrators, right? This is just like the case, right? If, if, you, are, if you fall into the category of having any numerous mental illnesses, you are exponentially more likely to be the subject of abuse, to be shot by the police, et cetera, than you are to ever take a gun to school and shoot someone else, right? So there's some way in which like, a lot of these conversations that we have about talking about mental illness are always in bad faith in the sense that they're about, again, doubling down on arming authorities to further penalize the people who are vulnerable. And that's the other element here, right? If you look at some of the technologies that are being offered for, um, uh, you know, in these schools in the space, where we talk about schools again, right? Literally, our answer to mental, like, to deal with the problem of mental health as supposedly leading to gun violence is to just produce surveillance systems that monitor kids' social media posts, right? To install audio mics that'll listen to what they say in hallways so that parents and police can be deployed rapidly. Right, none of these are good faith attempts to deal with the problems, but they do off offer us a way to arm yet more people and to flood those spaces with more guns. And to make a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money, right? The school security is a four billion dollar a year industry at this point, right? And also talk about like that responsibility gets put onto people individually. Well, the other thing that's striking here too is like we don't. The mental health is always about the perpetrator, right? It's always about well, what's the we have to worry about this kid who's going to go off one day. Right? And of course, like, I mean, first off, never mind the fact that like there always are red flags in all these cases, right? Like, I mean, like 2008, Adam Lanza, one of Nancy Lanza's friends, reported to the FBI that Adam Lanza was gonna shoot up San Diego Elementary School. It's true, this is in, it's in the state of Connecticut's debrief reports. Um, cops showed up, talked to Nancy, and decided they could do nothing because the guns were Nancy's. Right? This mass shooting in, in, in Ohio two months ago, right? That was also something that the shooter's mother alerted authorities. And they're like, well, there is guns. Like, I mean, the thing is, like, we think about these things, with the, sh the epistemic shift I want us to make, right, is to not think about these things as failures of the system, that only if we just tweak the right things, if we have another, if we have another armed guard outside the school restroom, if we have more surveillance, we can fix it. But this is a system working to protect the interests of the people it's working to protect. And that gets to your first and second question, right? Like, I don't think it's surprising that a system of Look, we live in a, a post-seller colonial society, right, that was built upon the idea of the homestead as the basic unit of production and the man and the head of household as having the right, you know, of, oh, fuck, we have like, how, like states in which like the doctrine of coverture was persisted until like the 70s, right? Like women didn't have a legal right to defend themselves against spousal rape. Right? If you look at the court cases like on this type of stuff, like women didn't have a right to legally defend themselves against rape by other people, except insofar as that they were protecting their own husband's properties, which was their bodies. Right? It, I don't, it, there's something um, strange about our being surprised that this is a system in which women are disposable. Right? It's all about empowering certain people. Right? It's all about preserving a basic cal calculus of human disposability. And, that gets, I, that's why it's social reproduction stuff. I'm much more talk about gender in the book, right? But like, we are, is it self-perpetuating in a very sort of bleak way, right? And it's always about shifting away from those basic states of the system to find who are the, who are the latest perpetrators, right? Who can we now finger as being the people who are in the problem? And this is, and, and we were in Glenn in the Ants class this morning talking about the increasing of, of white uh, ego um, fascism. And the way in which El Paso shooting, for example, if you read the manifesto of the shooter walking to a Walmart and liquidated 20 people, white man and white man killed mostly black men's immigrants um, because he's worried about resources and about climate change and them, those people having access to resources and his need to protect those resources, right? It's the same ideology as the shooter of the Christchurch Mosque in New Zealand and Andres Brodick in Norway. Yeah. It's a global phenomenon. And it's, and it's deeply rooted to Southern colonialism. Who gets to act?
access land and extract wealth from land, and who gets to use those resources and all the things that go along with that. Right. Climate denial. Uh, I've heard about this and I've shared this with you here. It's, it's fundamentally about salary content. <laughs> He's and saying, maintaining yeah. that system of extraction. Africa is not underdeveloped. It was intentionally extracted and continues to be extracted in order to so that we have these kind of like elaborate life cycles. Yeah, I, sh- I should sort of like, that's part of what, tr- what I was trying to do, what I wanted to do with this gambit of like these two examples, like the deranged mass shooter, Patrick Purdy, and then this person who, like, if you go to California, there's streets named after John C. Fremont everywhere, right? Yeah, it really has, like, there's tons of places named after this guy, right? Like, on the one hand, yeah, Purdy was clearly a pretend soldier who, you know, had some clear daddy issues and went to kill people at the school where he went to, right? Uh, on the other hand, like, I mean, John C. Fremont doesn't seem like the paragon of mental health either in a certain sense, right? Like, hit the ability to look at his face and be like, I can kill anyone in here and that's my prerogative. That's, that's the thing that means there's very little daylight between these two. So the other element here too is, why not think about mental health in terms of like, what about the mental health of this society that makes that imaginable in the first place, right? And also, what about the burden of mental health that's put on everyone to have to deal with it? Right? All the kids who are watching each other to be worried if your friends are going to be the next mass shooter. Right? We don't worry about their mental health, apparently. In fact, we just ask them to do more work. <laughs> we don't worry about their mental health. Right? Their mental yeah. Health. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're terrorizing the generation. I've got a question. Yeah. 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 So it seems uh, this is obviously a long historical uh, developing issue. And uh, talking about space, and I, it, I keep thinking about uh, a space that's not easily defined, and that's the space in our heads. And so much of this seems to be based on uh, things like fear and insecurity, um, and even the uh, um, we talk about uh, uh, whiteness and. It seems like not all whiteness is the same either. Um, it seems very clear when we talk about extraction, it's not an equal extraction for anyone except a few people, very, very few people. And it seems so often that uh, when people start to get their heads a little bit straight or start to raise questions, things get stirred up. It's like, it's like, it's like the fear and insecurity Uh, suddenly someone decides in certain places to tap into that and with false narratives, narratives that pit people against each other. Um, And so I really don't have, uh, there's a lot, you you talked about a lot here tonight and so I'm still uh, digesting much of it. But thinking in terms of solutions, it doesn't really seem like the problem's very well defined yet. And I would suggest and even ask this question, maybe the real place to start is with the, the, the psychology of people, the psyche. What's, what makes people do what they do? Bones are getting thrown out there all the time to, to keep people from barking too loud. So that's all. Yeah, I mean, how do you, you're, you're trained in psychoanalysis. Like, there's, I mean, like, this, like life in, that's an excellent question. Like, it's like, I also think, like, I think that, like, Steve Scalise, right? Remember the congressman who got shot playing baseball in Bethesda, like, two years ago, right? At the point at which a congressman can get hit with, like, four high-power rifle rounds and come out and be like, no, no, gun control is bad, and the real problem is the left and their guns, like, I mean, everyone is disposable, right? And... There's something about that that's like very hard for everyone, for anyone, I think, to realize, right? And making peace with our own relative disposability is a, I don't know, I, 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 I do reach for a spiritual category at that point. I'm not even psychological, right? I, re, I reach for something spiritual, like the idea that one can only do so much within the, against the face of a system against which you're just like gristle is, it's a very hard thing to ask of people, right? And 
here I'm, res I'm resonating back to you what you said, right? The, the, the dynamics of this always are, well, you need to do something right now, and that will make you feel better, which is itself a lie. Right. So this right. is, and then we haven't talked much actually about neoliberalism. Yeah. This is one of the logics, right, which is like, you, the individual, are responsible for dealing with this epic social failure. Yeah. We, so we talk about it in terms of stand your ground, you get a gun, you're the one who will be like, you know, the, 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 the winner. And, and what that does is it masks a larger conversation that we need to have around healthcare, yeah. uh, education, <laughs> jobs, um, all of the things that would actually stabilize a society. And, and uh, Jennifer Carlson yeah. actually might be worth talking about here. Jennifer yeah. Carlson, sociologist, who, who talks about the very rational reasons that people carry guns in a society that is decaying and failing. Yeah. Because it gives them a sense of security. Right. And you, you were just out yeah. there in Arizona presenting it there. Yeah. And I don't know if you want to talk about her work. And yeah, Carlton, so, uh, Jennifer's book is, is called uh, Citizen Protectors, and it's the everyday politics of guns in the age of decline. It's a brilliant book. I strongly recommend it, right? And, and she's, she's done ethnographic embedding with concealed carriers and with sort of like the concealed carrying license hacking apparatus in Michigan, which of course is a site of tremendous post-industrial decline and this sort of efflorescence of private policing and individual gun carry, right? So in other words, the, 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 the system of production has been taken elsewhere yeah. under globalization. Yes. And, and into that vacuum, you have the privatization of resources. This is what happened in Flint, Michigan, for example, the privatization of water and yeah. money. And, and, what's, and this is, I, I'm just riffing on that, like it's very striking, I'm just, I'll, just to throw this out there, how similar the responses of our social order have been to that problem, and they are to like climate change yeah, and right. those care scarcity, right? right? right. Like, don't use straws. Don't use straws, but also, so it's like, like, what, what, like, so in Flint, you can't get water, so what's the answer to that? Privatization, right? Extensive, like, water disbursement by companies doing charity, and all that water is protected by literal private and military companies, right? Puerto Rico, you can't get water. What's their answer to that? It's charity by corporations and the Pinkertons, right? It's this, we only have one script, right? And that's always about doubling down on these fungible modes of legitimacy, right? <laughs> but like, the key thing for me, and I keep coming back to it, it's like, if, if this whole democracy thing is gonna work, right? And I have the verdict still out on that. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll find out, maybe. Uh, it means accepting the fact that we're, you're gonna exist in public space with other people, and that means a fundamental vulnerability. Right? That means you have to be willing to accept the fact that other people can harm you in ways that are much more um, intangible than getting shot. Right? They're going to challenge your presuppositions. They're going to make you feel bad about your relative position. They're going to hurt your feelings. Right? And that's a hard thing to swallow when everyone is fighting their own individual battles vis-a-vis -vis precarity, vis-a-vis -vis mortality, etc. Right? And I, I don't. I don't know where to situate the intervention that fixes that, but I really like the idea of people having some degree of solidarity and realizing that everyone is facing a similar version, however different, you know, of this basic structure of disposability. And that's, I don't know, so that's, I, I hope that's a helpful response. So one, 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 one final question, yeah. One, one. There's something I don't understand. I'm an older guy, and when I went to school, in the 70s, I mean, people brought guns to school all the time, hunting season, things. Nobody would have ever thought about taking a gun in and shooting somebody. And we had bullies, we had everything. But society today has just changed so much. And I guess the question I have is, I don't know why we're concentrating so much on the gun issue as opposed, as opposed to the societal changes and the issues that have caused that. I mean, you go back through history, you look at the Aztecs and what they did to the other native tribes in the area. They, they didn't have guns. You look at the, I guess there was the Caribs and the Caribbean, the man-eaters that went into other islands, even maybe back to the Homo sapiens versus Neanderthals. I mean, it's always been about power and things like that. So why aren't we, looking at how to make society better rather than just concentrating, like you said, on all these little band-aids, you know? I, I think the conversation should be turned differently rather than just guns, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I think we, yeah. you would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree with that, yeah. I mean, yeah right. It's also, look, I'll, I'll be very clear, like, like there were, what I, I talk about this much more in the book, right, but the system that we have 
aggress currently live in aggressively eliminated social alternatives over the course of its development. Right? If, and I can get, I, I'd love to talk more about it, we talk about it afterwards, but like, if you chart the trajectory of firearms in the North American interior, in many cases, guns travel ahead of, ahead of colonizers. Right? They traveled up through the St. Lawrence, they went down the like, like, Missouri Valley, right? There, you have indigenous polities forming of Comanche, right? This is effectively an empire that's run on guns and raiding, right? And it was brutal too, right? But it was brutal in a different, like, I, 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 I want, this is very similar to my answer to that other question too, but like, my concern is like, well, what are the specific systems of exploitation that we're facing right now that having this wide distribution of guns makes possible? Right, and yeah, I definitely think that it's, there are questions, it, it's, 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 I don't think it's a trade-off, right? I don't think it's an either or, right? Like, I think the fact that like, again, the fact that like, gun, gun suicide is a great example of this, is it can be a great example of anything. All this immiseration, right? If you look at how suicide catches out, basically like people will have it, what people do when they're very young, right, in their teens, and then it's a pretty straight line until you get to the 50s, right? And men specifically start having health problems, start thinking about insurance, start thinking about their homes, start thinking about money, right? Yeah, exactly, right? So part of me is like, I mean, yeah, there are, we can talk broadly about questions of power, but also it's like these are specific structures of immiseration, right? That are also made all the worse by having ready access to firearms. Right, and that I think is something that sometimes is taboo to say, but like I think that if we're gonna do anything about any of these problems, we have to be willing to have, to think all these things simultaneously. And that in some ways the temptation to separate these things about like, this is a gun issue, this isn't a gun issue, right? The amount of people I've met who are like, no, 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 police shootings are not gun violence. Like, fuck are they? Sorry. Uh, I, but, but like, like clearly it is. Like, it, at the point at which like you're harassed by a dude with a gun on your hip, on his hip just because you happen to be driving your own car, I think that's a kind of gun violence, right? At the point at which a woman comes home and her partner is like, you know, fiddling with a gun and looking at her ominously, the gun isn't fired, but I still think that's a kind of gun violence, right? And so like, there's a way in which like, I think we have to have a flexibility vis-a-vis -vis these terms and reject the way that they're handed down as being different. I don't know what fixing that's gonna look like. I don't know what a society that's gonna not have these problems will quite look like, but I do know that clearly this is not working. Thank you all for coming.